Hi, I'm Frances Callier. And I'm Angela V. Shelton. And we're Frangela. You know what you need in your life? Hmm. The Final Word Podcast. Yes, you do. That's right. It is the final word on all things political and pop cultural. Where we make real news real funny. Where we inspire you so you can hashtag resist. Subscribe and get a new episode of The Final Word Podcast each week. It's the news we think you need to hear. That's right. We think you need to hear it. Okay? Yeah, it's what we say so. That's right. And because all we do is give, every Thursday you can listen to our hysterical podcast, Idiot of the Week. We round up the stupid because you know what? Somebody has to. Okay. All we do is give. Kills, a show that is proud to announce E. Jean Carroll is forever our type. 100%. Love it. I'm Liz Winston, and this week Marie is out, so it's the dynamic duo with me and my co-host, Moji Alwodale. Hey, Moj. Hey. This week on the pod, comedian Irene Tu's here to talk about her Big They Energy Tour, and Christine Soyoung Harley, president and CEO of Seekus, the dopest sex ed joint in the game, is here to talk about what you need to know. Apparently, what we all need to know is how to talk about sex ed. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I I don't need to know that. I, oh, I'm, I unless mean, I talk to myself in the mirror. You know, I'm parenting, so it's going to come up for the next decade plus of my life. <laughs> and you're raising a boy. I had a wonderful walk with my kid this morning. We were talking and he asked me kind of out of nowhere. He was like, where did I come from? And I was like, mm, I don't want him to look back and be like, mom lied to me. So I was like, you were always with me. And then we met your dad. And that's what, no, I said a part of you was always with me. And then we met your dad and the whole you came. Uh, and I felt really good about that. It felt appropriate. But he's 17, Moji. That's he's seems weird. Then. <laughs> <laughs> when he's 17, it's a different conversation. <laughs> no, I think that's sweet. It's slightly new. Like it's slightly pro-lifey in the, you were always with me. Listen. Or like that Jesus poem. You know, when they're walking on the footprints poem on the beach. Do you know that? No, I'm non-religious. I don't know that shit. So it's a big Christian, like it's a picture of sand and there's only one footprint on the beach. And the whole poem was, I was walking down the beach and Jesus was walking with me. And then I looked and first there was two sets of footprints and then there was one. And I said, Jesus, where have you gone? Have you left me? And Jesus said, no, I am carrying you. Oh, that's so lame. Yeah. Yeah. I was more going in like um, <clears throat> people with ovaries are born with them and all of the eggs they'll ever have are in there. And so I just needed a little bit of man juice. So I just went out into these streets and found an inseminator. And just, here you are, friend. And here you are. <laughs> it was a little more like that. No, I think it's sweet. I think that was the perfect way to tell a seven-year-old. Yeah, like All your what? menstruations are with you forever, too. So like, whatevs. Yeah, you're holding a lot. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to have those talks. The talks <laughs> I have are to my dog to say, please don't pee on my nice rug. Um, I don't know how to have that conversation <laughs> in a uh, sort of scientific evidence-based evidence-based uh <laughs> dog appropriate way or like appropriate way <laughs> so um yeah i know so christine is going to be able to really give us some good tips on sex ed i cannot wait also y'all we've been neglecting you and our inbox uh people write us we never get back to them so we decided that we're going to start actively combing the inbox look at your questions and Read some of them on the air because some of them are questions where a lot of folks are asking. It's good to get the information out in the world. And so we're going to start easy, go with one today so that y'all can hear some good information quickly from people who are asking stuff. So Moji, you want to, do you want to read the question? I live in a state where abortion is illegal. If I take the pills and need to go to the hospital, what's up? Mm. 
That's a good one. Yeah, it's a great one. It's kind of one of the most important ones. Uh, Liz, you want to answer or you want me to give it a, a little shot? I mean, why don't you take it? And then if I can add any wisdom, I will. Sure. Well, I want to start by saying we can't give medical advice, but what we can tell you based on everything we know and everything we've read is that when if you take the pills orally, they're undetectable in your system. There's no tests to find out if you take an abortion pill or not. And so you can always go to a hospital or an ER, even in a state that is not friendly to abortion and say you're having, you think you're having pregnancy or miscarriage complications. That's right. Also, you know, all of the information Moji just said is at the Plant C Pills website. Also, the CDC uh, has, you know, guidelines uh, around medication abortion. And really any questions you have around medication abortion, if you go to plantcpills.org, uh, they can really help answer that for you. And so I really feel like that's a really good question. And I just really love that that advice, Moji, that if you have taken pills that you got through the mail, nobody needs to know because they are no. not detected in your system. But that is only if you take them orally. You can take abortion pills vaginally. If you do, then there will be traces of the medication. So it is highly advised, if you can, to always take them orally. If you have any questions about laws in your state or how abortion works or anything else you think we can help with, send us an email at podcast at aafront.org and we will maybe read them on the air. Now, just remember, we can't get to all of them, so we may not be able to get back to you if you write us, but we want to get your very important questions on the broadcast. So please write us. We'll put the uh, email in the show notes, but it's podcast at aafront.org. Moji. Awesome. So now let's get to the meat of the show and kick it over to Alyssa, who has a smelly pile of this week's abortion news to drop on you. Hey, Alyssa. Hey, friends. Yeah, we've got a huge pile of steaming news dump for you today. It's so big, Lord Dern could shove her whole arm in there. So let's get into it. So let's start with Louisiana, shall we? They're saying goodbye you to human decency over there, Louisiana. The state consistently ranks last in literally everything, has doubled down to snag the complete bottom spot, once again by rejecting rape and incest exceptions for abortion. Let's throw Louisiana a bone here and rank them number one on a list of top dystopian nightmare hellscapes <laughs> for the 70% of Louisianians who think abortion rules. Hmm. Some Alabama lawmakers uh, don't feel that way, though, and want to pull protections for folks who get abortions, wait for it, anytime after fertilization. Oh, okay. I don't know about you, but I don't have like a check engine light that goes on when my eggs get pegged. So, <laughs> oh, you missed that? It didn't come with my factory settings. <laughs> um, so that means pretty much anything after sex other than reading the Holy Bible is immediately just murder worthy. So watch out. <laughs> oh my God. But as we all know, the anti-Obobo bozos will do just about anything to undermine actual progress. And the attorney general of Missouri is pulling some majorly sketchy shit to watch out for. But we've seen this time and again, that when ballot measures are put in front of voters, they overwhelmingly vote to support abortion, right? Yay. But when a pro-abortion ballot measure came up, Attorney General Andrew Bailey tried to add in language that would tell voters that restoring abortion rights would cost wait for billions with a B of dollars. Okay, so luckily the state auditor came up and said, um, no, I've done the math and actually it's only $51,000. How do you go from billions to $51,000? Um, you know, if you can't win fair and square, just keep lying. <laughs> That's it for me. Back to y'all. I read that article and I think that he said 51 billion and it was 51,000. And while you were reading that, I just quickly Googled, what the annual budget is for the entire state of Missouri, and it's $45 billion. So if somebody thinks that a ballot initiative is going to cost $5 billion more than the entire state budget of Missouri, maybe it's time to get rid of every fucking person who's holding office in Missouri. Are they not allowed to bring calculators into the room where they work? <laughs> is that the question? I don't know. But like, can you imagine? Like, I wonder how much money per person that would be. It's wild. Okay. That's like a year at a private college? Yeah. A year at a private college. That's, That's it. That's what Sally May told me. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Sally May told Alyssa. Alyssa, thank you for the not so great news this week. Thanks for having me. I'll see you next week. Okay. So now let's get to our big story, starting with this dude. I filed legislation to completely abolish abortion in Texas. And I was proud to co-author and pass the Texas Heartbeat Bill. We have a moral imperative <laughs> to protect children. And, and we're going to be judged on how we treat children and how our public policy impacts children. 
Yeah, that fetus loving defender of children is Brian Slayton, 45, who resigned on Monday from the Texas legislature after a state house investigation determined that he, A, supplied a bunch of alcohol to an intern and another underage drinking staffer. He had sex with the intern after he plied her with liquor and then sent her a threatening email saying everything would be fine if she kept quiet about the encounter. But that's just the overview. <laughs> Ew. Yeah. Oh, so he protects children by having sex with them? Well, or by getting, getting them drunk, drunk first. Okay, yeah, he's by getting, getting them, them off the streets oh, yeah. Yeah, by yeah. getting them drunk, having sex nice. with them in his not bachelor pad because he's married with two kids that he keeps in Austin where the capital is. Ew. Yeah. I know. It sounds like it was the worst kept secret in the legislature also. Oh, yeah. Other lawmakers knew about this, at least one. And nobody seemed to want to talk about how this family values man had no values. No. And it's actually three people filed complaints. And the thing is, <laughs> the woman he plied with liquor and had sex with, told her friends that he drove her home the next morning, stopping at a drugstore so she could get emergency contraception. And spoiler alert, Slayton at one point proposed to penalize the use of emergency contraception, including what is known as the Plan B pill. Good times. That seemed really obvious. I felt like we could, that was like written on the wall. Of course he did. <laughs> of course he did. I mean, it seems like now would be a good time just to talk about all the legislation he has supported in the past, right? Oh, I'm sure it's a great bunch, right? It's all, he's here for like trans rights and he's here for like abortion support and he's here for all well, the He's a stuff, one right? man P flag, you know, not. Like, okay. I, I mean, every Republican <laughs> accusation is a confession every time. We just always thousand percent need to remember always. that. Right, so- he is super for uh, the banning of the drag queen bill, saying that we can't have lute dancing in front of children, which if you've ever been to a drag queen story hour, there's no dancing. It's called story hour. He is proudly, as he said, you know, sponsored the heartbeat bills. He wants to expand gun rights and he wants. And then there was this weird one where when I did the deep dive on the dude, he proposed a bill that said he wanted to make sure that in Texas, that people abolished abortion before naming roads and bridges. How do we get to the abortion abolishment if we don't know what bridge to take? I, I don't know. How do you make maps <laughs> if nothing has names? What a fucking idiot. How do you get to the state house to make terrible legislation if you don't know? Like, I mean, I think he probably take. ran unopposed. So hopefully he's <laughs> I mean, he resigned. Hopefully they can get somebody new in there. Oh, wait, I wanted to bring this up because I was also freaked out. He was a youth minister. And I feel like every predator you hear about is a youth minister. And not just for five minutes, for 13 years, he was a youth minister. Oh, my God. I know. I know. And it, and here's what's really creepy is that he, he issued a statement when he resigned that said, I look forward to spending more time with my young family and will continue to find ways to serve my community and all the citizens of this great state. And it's like his young family. He's 45. I don't know what his young family is. I don't know. But he, the whole thing is super creepy. And, you know, like the fact that Texas actually would get rid of him, but then wholeheartedly supports other predators who we can't name because maybe they're running for office is just mm -hmm. disgusting. Yeah. And expected. And it's expected. really expected. Like, exactly. of course, you know all about grooming, which is why you want to talk about it. That's right. Let me take you on another horrible deception journey that starts in Texas and then, you know, spreads like a plague. In 2017, Texas added a statute that mandates doctors report from a list of 28 uh, medical conditions that are not related to abortion, but the doctors are required to call them abortion complications. And this includes things like endometriosis, any allergic response, um, just all kinds of stuff that is not related to abortion. In fact, it turns out abortion is so safe and complications are so exceedingly rare that people who oppose abortion have to do stuff like this, which is literally make up shit to make abortion seem dangerous. Wow. It's it's really just unbelievable to think that. And we were we were reading about this and it's so it's like if you've had an abortion and then throughout the course of your lifetime. You've been treated for endometriosis several times. Every single person who you saw about your endometriosis 
has to report that it's an abortion complication from the person who takes your blood to the doctor, to the nurses, and to the every time you go so that they're piling up fake abortion-related complications into a database so that they can say, look at all the different complications that have been reported when it's literally the same report over and over again. And it's like, okay, crazy stuff starts in Texas, but it turns out that this kind of reporting provision um, it exists in several other states. I looked at North Carolina, Arkansas, Idaho. It's kind of tough to research per se, but it's there's a lot of it and it's moving around. And when I was Googling to figure out like, well, where are these? What's happening? Um, almost every Google search that one of the top responses was directing me to the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Hold up. Charlotte Lozier Institute is our vocabulary phrase of the show. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know what the Charlotte Lozier Institute is, it was this sham research organization that was started in 2011. It is the, and I'm air quoting all over the place, research arm of the Susan B. Anthony list, which is the Emily's list for anti-abortion extremist political candidates. You might have heard them talking about how they were really mad when Donald Trump said that he was glad that abortion rules were going to go to the states and they and they were super pissed like they are like all in on anti-abortion everything all day. So what they did was they formed a research arm that does crackpot research. They basically come up with a theory. Let's say the theory is abortion causes breast cancer and they will do non-peer-reviewed studies. They'll just like do like ask some people if they've gotten breast cancer and did they have an abortion and then link it together. Not unlike, <laughs> not unlike this very thing that we're talking about, right? And exactly. so they are cited constantly. They own SEO. Right-wingers are constantly citing the Charlotte Lozier Institute. You know who loves to cite them the most is the Susan B. Anthony list. It's like, that mm. is so gross. It's like saying, how do you know that, you know, some, my grandpa told me like you invented yep. it, <laughs> you're just inventing it. And so it's really dangerous that when you were Googling that, that kept, kept coming up for you. And thank God we knew that that was not a credible research spot because it looks very shiny. looks very real. It looks so shiny. It's citing stuff. It turns out a lot of what it's citing is itself. <laughs> yes. like, I'm like, oh, there's citation that looks legit. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is really wild. Yeah. And they just, it looks, the papers look fancy, but they're not studied by actual like people in the field that do actual research. It's really a mess. And I'm going to put a really good link to a great organization called prolies.org. And they did a breakdown of the Charlotte Lozier Institute and just how crummy they are. And we'll put those in the show notes. It's, it's incredible how terrible they are. But also, Liz, I'm like jumping out of my seat because while I was digging, I also realized this is like, it was like a mind open. You know, when you're you're researching something, you're just like, I'm back in college. Every terrible abortion bill from Texas, every one of them is an amendment to this one bill. Wow. I know it's wild. This bill was passed in 2003. Uh, it was called the Women's Right to Know Act. And that's a piece of model legislation. If you Google that, you'll see all these other states that have passed Women's Rights to Know Act. Um, and that was basically Americans Reunited for Life introducing this bill. It was an informed consent bill. And the informed consent is essentially the bill that makes doctors have to lie to pregnant people before they have abortions and say things like complications or breast cancer and insanity and depression and all of these things that are not. Sterility. <laughs> but it passed in 2003. And a fun fact no one in Texas challenged it in court, not a doctor. No one did. I'm not saying when it was on the floor, Democrats didn't say something, but once it went into effect, no one said anything. And eight years later, they started amending that bill in 2011, 2013, 2016, 2017. Uh, SB 8, the bounty hunter law was the 2021 edition to this. And when I'm saying every bill, I'm talking about anyone who studies anything abortion. When you remember Wendy Davis standing outside of Texas yelling, that was an amendment to this bill. When you remember that uh, we we actually went to the protest when whole women's health, v. Hellerstadt was uh, argued at the Supreme Court, that's an amendment to this bill. It is wild that essentially had somebody stood up in 2003 and said, wait, what? Perhaps we'd have abortion 20 years later in Texas. 
You know, that is amazing, Moji. And I, I was reading the research on it too, and just seeing how it was like, it turned out, it was like this monstrous bill and they just kept piling on and piling on and piling on. And when they started the amendments in 2011, that was the Wendy Davis year. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking that's when my whole life changed. That's when I went from, what am I going to do next to I'm going to merge my comedy and my abortion activism all into one thing because people aren't doing anything. And I remember watching that Wendy Davis filibuster on the floor of the Texas State House, streaming it online because no news media was covering it and watching Twitter and everybody else blow it up and force force the news to start carrying it. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes me sad about Twitter, right? Twitter, Twitter used to be that place where if the public saw something and they had outrage about it, the traditional media would follow suit. And so it was this great conduit to raise awareness about things that were important that weren't being reported on. And it's like, that was the snowball of where, which we all just, Mm -hmm. it just never stopped from that point forward. And that's when I started and haven't stopped from that point forward. So yeah, literally just you, right? I mean, and obviously a handful of other people, we're not the only people who've been talking about the, the dumpster fire that is abortion access in this country. But the idea that all these things were happening and for a lot of them, people were just like, I guess. Yeah. Like, well, I and, guess. And, 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 you know, it's like, I don't know what happened between 2003 and 2011 that people weren't advocating it out in the streets and we didn't know. And the fact that that piece of legislation was dropped in other states, right? You know, but then it just feels like even from 2011 on, there's been handfuls of advocates trying to do a bunch of work. But truthfully, it's it, it was laid at the feet of the people providing the care and they don't have time. They were literally providing the care, trying to correct the record on the bullshit being laid out and then having to lobby the politicians and raise awareness to the public. You can't expect somebody who provides care to have skill at any of that, which is why Abortion Access Front started so that we could fill that hole to be the voice and sound the alarm. And also like, you know, you just asked like what happened between 2003 and 2011. Some people were still surprised by the Dobb decision. That's what happened, right? Like it was a lot of people just asleep at the wheel. Millions of people. I mean, yeah, that's exactly right. And all of our politicians asleep at the wheel. Well, and we've been on the road and traveling to, you know, 35 states and doing all this stuff and trying to tell people it's happening in the state houses. Are you paying attention to where you live? And, you know, it, it, it's been a rough road, which is, I guess, why this podcast, I just feel like this podcast is really important. And I'm really love this podcast. And I really want to give a shout out to Jessica Valenti for doing this every single day and providing really good information. She's the one who, as we were looking at stuff on her Substack, she had some really good details, which led you down to a different path to find out this sort of larger narrative and story. And I'm going to transition out of this because as we said at the beginning of this story that, you know, this legislation was dropped in many places. And one of the places is North Carolina, who this week has had a bunch of bullshit come down the pike. Uh, North Carolina is a state that is on a repro roller coaster right now. And it is a, a sneakily announced and passed piece of legislation that has a slew of anti abortion BS in it that includes a 12 week ban, a, a 72 hour waiting period. A clinic has to have a hospital within 30 miles of where they're they're going to practice it. And like, who knows how many Catholic hospitals are in North Carolina. Uh, And it's really bad because North Carolina has been a respite and a hub for the Eastern Seaboard and for the South. And now we don't know what's going to happen. Now, the governor of North Carolina is pro-choice and he vows to veto the bill tomorrow. But that's where this story gets really complicated and super mucky. So first, let's just talk about the ban. Also, the bans, right? Everything in it, the the reporting, the everything is also in Texas, right? It's like, this is still more sneaky model le- legislation that's been moving around. Like, these aren't original thoughts. These are the thoughts that are tried, true, and effective from the anti-abortion movement. And um, they're just walking into the playlist. But these are things that decimate access and make it hard for people to accept, you know. And North Carolina is one of the few places in the South where you can get abortion access. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's right. And the abortion funds are really hurting. They have their coffers are dwindling. Um, the providers are really scared. Um, for those of you that don't know, North Carolina is also a hotbed of anti-abortion extremist breeding. It is where Operation Rescue's OG people live, like Flip Benham. His kids have started something called Love Life, which is this kind of creepy, feel-good, hipster, guitar mass, anti-abortion supremacy bullshit. The clinics in North Carolina will see upwards of 5,000 protesters sometimes during March for Life and during this stuff. I mean, it is, it's an assault in and of itself. And this feels really scary. So here's the governor's dilemma. In North Carolina, there is a one-person anti-abortion supermajority that could override his veto of this bill. And he says he's confident someone will not vote to override. He thinks that there is somebody out there who wants to protect access. But who? Maybe it's this woman. My first pregnancy ended in an induced physician-assisted miscarriage. While I served in this chamber, this decision was up to me, my husband, my doctor, and my God. It was not up to any of you in this chamber, and I didn't take a survey. Well, that woman is Trisha Cotham, a Republican from North Carolina, speaking to the Republican chamber. As of a month ago, she was Trisha Cotham, Democrat, pro-choice Emily's List endorsed, who just told her, what did she call it? Physician assistant miscarriage. That is my favorite euphemism for abortion I've heard this week. Right. So she just told her abortion story, switched parties, and now is the one person that this governor hopes will vote with him and not vote to overturn the bill. I mean, it's really unbelievable that this person who has been a lifelong Democrat decided to switch parties knowing that the drumbeat of the Republican Party was coming down in North Carolina to literally put the gauntlet down on abortion. But she claimed that she had to switch parties because she just, the Democratic Party that she knew, she didn't recognize anymore. And she literally said one of the reasons that she had to switch parties was because when she used the praying hands emoji online, she was bullied. I don't think she's ever been bullied. <laughs> if, if that's what makes you think you're bullied, you've never been bullied. And maybe just leave politics entirely. Because if you literally are like, you know what? Some people were mad at me that I used the praying hands emoji. So what I'm going to do is switch parties and change my entire moral fiber and code and ethics and belief system and now become a Republican and vote against everything that I believed in up until a month ago. That is the wild part that she's almost pretending like there's a subtle difference between Republicans and Democrats, a, a slight ideological shift as opposed to like a fundamental difference in the rights that individuals should have in their bodies. I mean, if you were a Democrat a month ago and then you switched, the only thing you have in common with Republicans is the prayer emoji. Mm. <laughs> that is also it. the hypocrisy. You've got that and you've got oh, that. Yeah. You've got that. And walking so, right into the hypocrisy. Yeah. And so we'll see what happens after the vote and if people are going to come forward, if the uh, override will happen and how good old Trish, who I don't think of a prayer emoji when I think of old Trish, is going to weigh in on all of this. It is a just unbelievable. It's an unbelievable story. Yep. Well, these stories will be in our show notes. And as always, we remind you the best and most up-to-date, up-to-the-minute resource on accessing abortion care and funding care is INeedAnA.com. That's right. So now we're going to get into our guest who hopefully is going to give Moji a whole bunch of tips on sex ed. <laughs> I did not know this, but May is sex ed for all month. And so that makes it doubly awesome that we are going to talk sexual health, family planning, and sexual pleasure with the president and CEO of SECUS, Sex Ed for Social Change, an organization that for the past 55 years has advocated for a vision of sex ed 
that protects against sexual violence, affirms youth, and advances reproductive justice, gender justice, and LGBTQIA plus rights. Please welcome Christine Soyoung Harley. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi. It is so exciting to talk to you because y'all are like the Beyonce and Jay-Z of like birth control and sex ed. You are just this amazing behemoth that keeps doing incredible work. And I don't know that our listeners actually know the rich history of Seekus and like how y'all got started 55 years ago and uh, what the trajectory and evolution is. Let's just kick off with who you are. Uh, that is the kindest thing. I've never been referred to as Beyonce and Jay-Z at the same time. And so <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so CECAS was formed in 1964 as the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States, which is a very 1960s-esque organizational name. Um, and we were formed uh, by Mary Calderon, who was actually a doctor at Planned Parenthood who was you know, receiving patients who didn't know anything about the reproduction, about their sexual history, about how to ma navigate sexuality in healthy ways. And she was like, if we could just get people information, this would go so much better. And so she started Seekus. Um, and so for all of this time, we've been advocating for sexual human sexuality to be respected and understood as a human right, as something that is natural, healthy, and normal. Uh, and then when I got to Seekus in 2019, we decided to update our name and call ourselves Seekus Sex Ed for Social Change, because we really wanted to talk about how sex education can be a strong foundation for laying the kind of core values that we want in America. If we can recognize human sexuality across gender, across sexual orientation, across race, uh, around um, sexual violence, around all of these issues that America is grappling with right now, we can actually lay a foundation where people can affirm and value and respect each other regardless of these things and because of these things. And sex education that is shame-free, that is evidence-based, that is age-appropriate, helps us have a more respectful and affirming society um, that respects and values diversity. And so that's the conversation that we want to have. We want to talk about sex education beyond just pregnancy prevention, beyond disease prevention, but really in this way of affirming all of us and creating um, a safer, more supportive community for all of us to thrive in. That's awesome. Oh, 100%. It's so, it's such an incredible mission. And just jumping ahead a little bit, you know, this week there's huge news because the FDA is like finally considering over-the-counter birth control um, access for more people. Can you just tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it is very exciting. This week, an advisory committee recommended that the FDA bring birth control pills over the counter without age restrictions. So that would mean that folks would be able to access birth control at their local pharmacy without having to go to a doctor's office, without having to navigate medical interventions, which is amazing. And is it a step in the right direction when we know that so many people rely on birth control for medical reasons, as well as to um, control their reproductive schedules. And, you know, I want to make clear that it's not a decision by the FDA. So we still right. need for that approval to come through. But it is certainly a step where we are saying that all people should have access to the ability to manage their own reproductive rights as, as much as they can. And so I'm really excited about this. This is great news. I think everyone should flood the FDA and tell them to approve this. <laughs> it's also super excited because as like access is being diminished and doctors are fleeing states, the states that really need the support, it's going to be harder and harder to get this sort of care, um, even if you wanted to have a prescription. Absolutely. And I think it also makes it easier for telemedicine to be utilized to distribute uh, birth control, which is equally important for places where access to care is being diminished. Especially when we're seeing in some states, like tech, you know, Texas just always leading the way in leading the way backwards, uh, you know, proposing laws that say if you are somebody who is a minor, that you can't access birth control without your parents' permission from any federally funded place that would distribute birth control. So to be able to have these set of, of national standards, I think is super cool. When you just sort of laid out what Sikas does, 
you hit on so many of the topics that are just so important. And I think, you know, raising awareness and stigma busting is is really at the heart of changing minds when it comes to how we talk about sex and sexuality, because I think all of our listeners know pretty specifically that there are certain people in our society whose desires, whose sexual selves are completely accepted. And I'm talking mostly about cis white men, you know, they get to just kind of gallivant about. And those of us who are women or people who are, are gender expansive, we don't get to enjoy the same sort of sexual pleasure outwardly, even though we're all sexualized to death. Um, talk a little bit about how your work plays into like that whole realm of allowing all of us to have safe, healthy sexual lives. So what I thought I thought you were going to go is kind of how that's playing out in society right now. Um, and I well either that's... okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I think there's a couple of different things. I mean, first of all, I want to say that we really looked at the Supreme Court's rationale on the Dobbs decision to be a really clear through line around how the right is trying to undermine sexual and reproductive rights writ large. You know, the entry point was this attack on abortion care, but actually in the way that they undermined the right to privacy, they pointed to, and I don't know how many people caught this, and it really struck me and stood out when I read this, but they actually pointed to the Magna Carta as the basis for saying, well, this is an unenumerated right that is not in the Constitution, therefore it doesn't fully exist. The Magna Carta is a 13th century royal charter of rights adopted by some king in England, which is a time when only propertied white men held any kind of power at all. And everyone else, people of the global majority, women were essentially human chattel. And so if that's the basis for what is a right and how we are grounding our constitution, like that's beyond bizarre. But the right to privacy not only was about the right to abortion care, but it's a right to contraception. It's the right to private sexual activity in your own home. It's the right to same-sex sexual relations, and it's the right to interracial marriages, right? So all of these rights that we are seeing be just um, attacked left, right, and center are all grounded in this effort to both undermine our democracy and restrict our sexual and reproductive freedom for non-white, non-propertied people and non-men, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's really important for us to understand because when we are seeing these attacks on abortion care and then also in sex education, I think a lot of people who are like, ration minded would be like, well, if you don't want abortion, then you should support sex ed. You should support access to contraception. And yet the people who oppose all of these things oppose all of them together. And I think it is, you know, just it is around the who gets to control the reproduction, the power uh, in the United States. And we have to understand it from that perspective, because otherwise all of this doesn't make sense. It's just a bunch of spaghetti being thrown against the wall. And we're like, what is going on? All of us are under attack because of these reasons. And I think that when we talk about sex education and how it could shift that, what we're talking about are healthy relationship skills, right? If we if we actually do start sex education in kindergarten or earlier, what we're doing is we're teaching young kids to know their body part names, to know if a touch is something that they are uncomfortable with, to seek help and know how to find help, to know that there are different family structures um, that exist in their communities and to be comfortable with that. It creates a foundation of respect and understanding of one's own body and autonomy and respecting the body and autonomies of their peers. I mean, it's not sex-based, it's relationship-based, how to be a good friend. You don't hit people if you're angry at them. This lays a foundation for us to say, oh, well, if I know that I can say no to somebody touching my body inappropriately, it leads into conversations around sexual violence. We don't take advantage of other people's bodies without permission and without consent. Um, it opens up conversations of, you know, there are different sexual orientations or gender identities and expressions, and that's all okay. There are families that look like mine or don't look like mine, and that's all okay. We can be respectful of that and acknowledge that. And what we know is that when we do those things and we affirm the reproduction of people of color and recognize that 
human sexuality transcends races and that's all normal and healthy and, and valuable, you know, it really creates a different conversation that we're having when we're talking about all of these different things. And that's why we talk about sex ed as a vehicle for social change. It's a vehicle for changing how we understand and relate to each other. Oh my gosh. I really love that you brought us here because one of the valuable tools that we find is that you put out this annual comprehensive state-by-state -state report on sex ed and the laws around it. And one of the things that stood out to me is you have a four-point system, right, which are like mandated sex education, HIV, STI education, some healthy relationship education, and then detailed healthy relationship education. And one of the things, two of the things that stood out to me, A, not one state or DC hit all four of the points. And the one that was most ignored was the four, the detailed healthy relationship education, which really seems like foundational and um, and no one seems to be paying any attention to it. Like very few states are even acknowledging it as something that is a foundational relationship thing that we could use. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know you talked just a little bit more, but I just thought that was fascinating. Yeah. And I think that that stems from the way that our country has talked about sex education primarily as a means of preventing unplanned teen pregnancies for such a long time that we haven't acknowledged these other benefits that an evidence-based age-appropriate sex education program can actually offer to young people. Um, and so it is really unfortunate. And at the same time, I think that it is one of these spaces that as we talk about sex education more holistically, we are seeing where, one, most parents want their kids to be taught these things. So they're like, yeah, of course, that's what we want. Two, we are seeing bipartisan movement on this as well. That there, For example, in Oklahoma in 2021, we were able to get um, legislation passed to teach consent education. But you know, there's a little bit of a rebranding that we have to do as we're talking about sex education and talking about all of the benefits that sex education can offer. But certainly the healthy relationship skills, how to navigate consent, how to navigate rejection, how to um, be clear about your decisions around abstinence, if that's what you choose to do. Like these are all things that young people need to be taught. Understanding relationship dynamics, what's an abusive relationship, what's a healthy relationship, and using that to um, be able to navigate their own personal relationships, saw skills that, I mean, I think many adults are like, I wish I had that. I wish we knew that. <laughs> As you were talking, I'm like, I remember I'm a woman in my forties. And I remember when I was in college, there was conversation because one college had really like detailed consent steps. And I remember that being a punchline and looking back being like, no, that's really smart. <laughs> like, that's in fact what we need. Like that's a, such a good starting place, especially for college students to then go and navigate adult relationships with like, this is a framework. Maybe you don't ask step by step, but you sort of look for and try to get affirmative consent. It's so necessary. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's just been a sea change in my adult lifetime. Yeah. And also the sea change that I'm so glad to finally see, but I, and I'd love to know where you see us in, in the progress chain is having young men also really understanding that. I mean, forever we have been, we've taken on the burden of our own consent and, and protecting ourselves. And it, it hasn't been a two-way street. You know, I often would say, you know, if, if you're having a great time and you say, ouch, you're on my hair, that's consent. Like, just use it like that. It's like easy. It's easy stuff to say, I, I enjoy this. I don't enjoy that. And why that has become a negative and B, why the burden has fallen on us all the time as women, it's just astounding. Have you seen good sea change on that and good, and good um, movement towards having it be a very inclusive way to talk to folks about it? Well, I, first of all, I want to be clear that the lessons that you're talking about is abstinence only until marriage programming, which the federal government has funded billions of dollars over the last several decades to support schools in teaching. That's why so many of us received abstinence only education, where kids are coerced into signing, you know, purity pledges and and young girls are taught that they are responsible for not only protecting their virginity but also for being responsible for the sexual aggression of their male um, counterparts and all of that shame and you know, particularly that if you were having sex outside of a heterosexual uh, monogamous marriage 
you are a tor- terrible, horrible person who is going to fail at life breeds all of this rape culture, shame based fear and lack of ability for us to be able to talk about our pleasure and wants and desires in these relationships. And so we all stumble and fumble and mess up until finally, you know, as adults, we're like, okay, we want to be sex positive. How do we do this? So I want to be really clear that that is part of federal funding that is happening. That's also why CECAS is advocating for RIA, the Real Education and Access for Healthy Youth Act, which would be the first federal legislation that would actually fund comprehensive sex education programs in schools, particularly making sure that our most vulnerable young people, kids of color, LGBTQ youth, kids going to under-resourced schools would have access to the funding to be able to receive the programming that provides this evidence-based, shame-free, age-appropriate programming to help them receive information to be more healthy in their lives. And May is uh, Sex Ed for All Month. And so RIA is going to be introduced um, this month by Representatives um, Barbara Lee, Alma Adams, and Pramila Jayapal. So we're very excited about it. And you can go to seek us and help us speak to your members of Congress to join on as co-sponsors and to support this legislation. Because we definitely want to move away from that abstinence-based shaming education that makes all people not know how to navigate their sexuality, their desires, or their decision-making in ways that are healthy for us as a society. That is so exciting, especially as a mother of a seven-year-old male. Um, I'm doing the best I can for consent education, but it's, you know, it has to happen with other children. It has to happen in a age-appropriate way, but with other people, it's exciting. Listen, we've seen some pretty wild and oppressive changes. Uh, We talked about some of the good, but we've seen some pretty wild and oppressive changes in states in 2023 alone. Can you give us some of the more alarming trends you've seen coming out and and ways we could fight them? Yeah, um, it is scary. I mean, certainly after many years of seeing actually forward progress on um, sex education bills. In 2022, there was a 430% increase in public school curriculum censorship bills, which all ended up being a tax on sex education program guised under sort of, you know, don't say gay or anti-trans or anti-anything gender sexuality in schools. But, you know, that's what sex ed is. And then in 2023, we saw an upsurge in those attacks. So In all of 2022, there were 721 bills. In 2023, there were 718 bills, 70% of which were oppositional hate-based bills. Um, It's really been like a spaghetti against the wall approach. Um, They're using parental rights. They're using, you know, attacks on uh, library books, attacks on curriculum, you know, whether it's about race-based history or LGBTQ inclusion, conversations about any of these things to really come after school, sexual and reproductive freedom. It's alarming. We are seeing from 2022 to 2023, they're taking all of the spaghetti and mashing it into these big omnibus bills. Some of those, uh, many of those are starting to pass this year. So I do think that this is going to be a sea change in terms of where we see states stand on a lot of this stuff. So it is definitely an all four car alarm a moment. The thing that's important for everyone to know is that being informed and pushing back on these attacks is much more likely to see us succeed in overturning or having bills defeated. And that is the main message. Don't sit on your haunches and wring your hands. Stand up, go to school board meetings, join your PTA, push back on these things, go to your state legislators, talk to your states, because we can't allow these attacks to to stand. And going to Seekus website, you can learn, you can find out how to get involved. We're going to put all of the information there so that people can actually learn how best to fight back, especially it's all local. Like, you know what? Stay local. Push your Congress people to vote for RIA and then really find out local. And so we're going to put all of that stuff in the show notes. Chris, thank you for bringing so much wisdom and just reminding us all about what we can do and where we're at. It's incredible. Thank you for your work. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed being here. You can follow Christine and Sikis's work at the links in our show notes. And don't forget to contact your congressperson and ask them to reintroduce the Real Education and Access for Healthy Youth Act. 
And now the party game that is faster than Monopoly and more fun than Taboo, Six Degrees of Abortion. And this is when I, or Marie, take a story from the news and Liz has six chances to link it to abortion. Let's see if I've got what I need to stump her this week. Liz, I'm actually really excited about this one and I think it will be super easy, but I just wanted to talk about it. So uh, it was announced that Rihanna, my queen, has named her child RZA, RZA, like from the Woo, aka Bobby Digital, uh, which is hilarious to me. And I would like you in six chances or less, link Rihanna to abortion. I thought I was going to link RZA to abortion. Yeah. You know, you're not so great with the I can rap. I can link Riza to abortion. You know what? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we were down in DC um at the Reason Rally before it got turned into an alt-right thing, like about six years ago. Uh, and I spoke at the Reason Rally about abortion and keeping, you know, uh religion out of abortion. And we tabled there. And guess who played on stage? Wu Tang. Bobby Digital. Yeah. Oh my God. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so do the math. And so do the math. We are, we are abortion. Uh, me, AAF, <laughs> tabling at a concert with Wu-Tang. <laughs> I'm just saying. Well done. Thank you. Well I was done. on stage. Well I was like on stage. I, like I could have just story. said, you know, I, I, I opened for Wu-Tang <laughs> in DC. I should have just said it that way. That would have been great. Right now, that would have been <laughs> one degree. One degree. Well done. Also, what a fun name for a child. Just capital R, capital Z, capital Yeah, it's a. cute. It's really good. <laughs> I know. I was laughing with friends about it. And I was like, oh, Riza, you know, the guy who does my taxes. Riza at UPS. And I'm like, uh, Riza, the child of a billionaire queen. It'll be good. It's all good. <laughs> Excellent. Nice work. Nice work, Maji. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and I also go. just pivoted and went right out of Rihanna into Riza, but it was actually more fun. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. good. It was good. <laughs> you didn't think I had it in me, but um, let's transition to speaking of being on stage. This is a good transition because guess who's going to be live doing their podcast live for those of you in the New York City area? Your buzz kills. That's right. All Three of us. All three of us. It's so exciting. We're going to be live at Drum in New York City. It's in the East Village on Avenue A, June 7th. Doors are at 7.30, blah, blah, blah. The link to that is in the show notes, but it's going to be so awesome. Oh my gosh. We have such great guests. We have Murray Hill, actor, comedian, and legendary New York personality. Um, you may have seen on HBO, Somebody Somewhere. Um, and we also have dope activists from NYC for Abortion Rights, which is an incredible organization. And they're going to give us the scoop on how they take the anti-abortion movement on with fun and awesome actions. I've been there in the streets with them. It's great. And also they'll talk about how you can get involved. And the best part of a live pod is you. We're going to do have interaction with the audience. We're going to have you get to have Q&A with us. We're going to have Alyssa live doing the news. We're going to be doing all your favorite segments live. Maybe if you want, you can email some good stories for six degrees, just mm -hmm. live news, Q and a fun shenanigans and amazing abortion news. So that is June 7th at drum in the East village, NYC. Come see your buzz kills live. Oh my gosh. It's going to be so much fun. So much fun. You know what else is fun? <laughs> Our next guest. <laughs> Oh my God, she is so much fun. Oh, joining the Buzzkills today is a hilarious badass. She's a stand-up comedian and writer who is currently traveling the country on her big They Energy tour. Please welcome Irene too. Welcome, Irene. Hey, Irene. Welcome, Irene. Hi. Great to have you here on our month, since they keep on giving us months, sometimes half months. I know it, half, it really varies. Months. When they start at mid, like when it's a fortnight with both months, oh, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure what I feel about that. But here we are, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Appreciation Month. I will also acknowledge, and Moji has said this, that Europe isn't a continent. It's a construct. <laughs> and, what, you know, we should all think about that. And those of you that aren't sure on the geography, go take a look at the map. It's like a little peninsula off Asia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're so glad you're here joining us. And I wanted to open up with a really good statement you've made in your comedy. You've said you like to be slightly provocative at minimum. 
And I was curious, what does that what does that mean here in in today's Marjorie Taylor Greene's America? Oh, man, I think that's a little too provocative. (laughs) That's a little bit more than what I do in my comedy. Um, For me, I just love comedy that gets you to think. I mean, I also love, you know, silly comedy. But for me, it's more interesting if I can say something that makes you think differently than how you normally think. Um, So that's kind of how I view comedy. What would you define something that you talk about that's slightly provocative? Maybe the minimum provocative? And then... What's your maximum provocative? Like, what is your range, provoco range? Yeah, I would say minimum, probably like I do a joke that maybe people have seen about like um, gendered bathrooms, where I talk about how people always approach me in like women's bathrooms thinking like I'm a man and kind of talking about that. So that's kind of, kind of like an issue that is like a hot topic still for some reason in this country. Yeah, I don't know you're why. You're a nation. It's like getting hotter by the minute, which makes no sense. I'm like, it's been years. Let it, <laughs> yeah. let us pee. Let it go. While they want to take period products and changing tables out of everywhere. So again, I'm kind of like, well, you are literally new. Nobody's getting anything now. <laughs> like, totally. What? It doesn't make any sense. It, it's sort of like um, anticipation at this point. You know, they just <laughs> keep telling us all of these terrible things that are going to happen. And then they never do, whether it's in a bathroom, whether it's people just dying of abortion pills when they never have before, whether it's reading, see, you know, books about our racist history at what point will you just realize it's not happening chicken little whatever the chicken little situation is around our rights is crazy at some point it's like maybe just go to therapy like yeah (laughs) it might be you (laughs) yeah fair enough because it's always like if you have such a like shitty fragile life that somebody else's life that you don't know in a state you're never going to is somehow destroying the fabric of who you are, um, you're a mess. Yeah, it, you might want to look inward instead of trying to deal with all this. I also wonder what they're doing in the bathroom that they're paying attention to other people. So when I go in the bathroom, I go into a stall and then I do whatever I do in there and then I come out and I wash my hands. And I just don't see like why whatever I've done here infringes on anyone's situation. It's <laughs> crazy. I've never gone in a bathroom doing anything other than I'm going immediately to the stall, doing what I got to do, go to the sink, and then I leave. I don't talk to anybody in that. No. What, what are you it's doing? Like my biggest fear is, is, and everyone has had this experience, like, you know, when you get off a plane and you have to pee so bad that you think you're going to die. And then all you do is pray to whatever you pray to that when you open that stall door, it's not a crime scene behind mm-hmm, there mm-hmm, that mm-hmm, some mm-hmm. person that ha- has not just polluted the bathroom. That's all anyone cares about. Just give me a yep. stall that is not, yeah, doesn't look yeah, like yeah. a dumpster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe instead of worrying about who's in the bathroom, let's worry about why the bathroom is a mess in the first place. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's in the bathroom? Let's clean up the bathrooms. A hundred percent. Um, I guess the max, I have a new joke that I'm worried, uh, working on, I guess, trigger warning, um, but it's about like suicide. Um, so that is kind of, you know, something that we don't really talk about as a society, but also obviously impacts uh, us every day. So I kind of do joke about that. Yeah. Is it funny? Yes. And okay. for me, it's always like funny first, right? Like I, I, I pick a topic that I want to address, but I also am like, for me, it's like the joke has to be funny enough where if I'm going to like really be thought provoking and have people maybe be a little uncomfortable, it's still it has to be extremely funny. We here at Feminist Buzz Killed, we like to talk about Mac provocative and men, but also I think we like to acknowledge that we're all just a little bit basic. So what's the most basic thing about you? Um, The most basic don't say thing about spice me. Latte. No, no, I don't like pumpkin spice latte. So I'm not that basic. Um. <laughs> but I'm a huge fan of Taylor Swift. Okay. Yeah, super basic, but also reasonable. I mean, I think it's like, okay now too. I feel like everyone's back on the Taylor Swift bandwagon. So I feel good about it. For a while, people weren't on board. So then I had to not tell people I like Taylor Swift. So it went from a guilty pleasure to like, I'm just all out living in my basic Taylor Swift self. Yes, Exactly. The thing about Taylor Swift fandom is like, she's a decent musician. (laughs) I I think she's a great singer. She writes all of her music. She is prolific. Mm -hmm. She's one of those people that I think 
Yeah, everybody wants to like, and I think maybe it's just because on paper, like it it feels like she, you know, you shouldn't like her. Like people get ketchup is also very basic. Mm -hmm. It's also a sheer (laughs) delight, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that like people want to find shit wrong with her. And I I don't know why that is. I mean, I I'm very neutral on Taylor Swift. Like when I hear it, I'm like, that's fun. Mm -hmm. But like I don't, I don't know why people have such disdain. Was there some at some point it, it was warranted? I don't know. I think it's just because she's so big and so famous and people get jealous or they, they like to tear down people that are huge. Yeah. yeah. And she's kind of like a like a goody two shoes kind of vibe. And I think people like to hate on that. I think her milk toast vibe also for a while made people think like, is she Aryan Barbie like she looks? And then at yeah. some point she was like, oh, is this my rap? I'm going to work on that. Yeah. Aerie and Barbie. That's one that they, maybe they'll put that out for the also, Jesus season. Also, that's like a double negative or a double positive. I was about to say, like, isn't Barbie that Barbie? Is very, very <laughs> we actually need that qualifier for the not white Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> Aerie and Barbie. So we're talking about all of these amazing things, but we have not gotten to the fact that you're currently on tour right now. And it looks like your last stop is going to be in Tampa, Florida. So A, uh, how's it going? And how are you preparing for that? That welcome wagon as you work out, work out jokes, work out your different set topics. Um, it's great. I just started the tour um, this year, um, doing a lot of headlining shows. We're adding more dates. So check my website, come see me on tour. Um, it's been great. We've sold out a bunch of the shows, which I was very excited about. A little bit surprised because I wasn't sure. This is like my first headlining tour. I didn't know how many people were going to show up. So I was really excited about that. And yes, we did add Tampa, Florida. I've never performed comedy in Florida. Um, I don't even remember the last time I was in Florida. Yeah, it sounds reasonable. So I'm a little nervous. But I heard Tampa has like a lot of gay people. Yeah, it's got a really fun queer scene for sure. Yeah, so I think it'll be fine. And I think it's like, you see me. So if you're buying tickets to see me, I think you know what you're getting. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah actually i want to say that because your your tour is called big they energy but uh you simply use she her pronouns so can you explain what big they energy means to you in this context especially because it's an audio medium oh yes yeah. so i did name my tour big they energy it's after a joke of mine um where i talk about pronouns and stuff and i think people when they see me they just assume my pronouns are they them which is like fine and that's why i wrote a joke about it and i i think it's just like funny because i think anybody can have big they energy mm-hmm. for me that just means i don't give a fuck <laughs> <laughs> So, like, I made shirts that say Big They Energy. People wear them. It doesn't matter what you look like. You're just like, yeah, like, I don't care. Big They Energy. It's like kind of, I think, the queer equivalent of, like, Big Dick Energy. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Which I think is really fun. And, you know, it's wild in these days to be doing comedy, to just be in the world and with living in multiple ways that people are just super pissed off that we're alive and saying stuff like a how does that affect how you do comedy and how does that play a role coming into the shit you decide to talk about and also conversely how do you deal with the haters because we got a lot of them yeah we do have a lot of haters for me i just try to ignore that because there's no point in engaging with the haters because i feel like it's just draining And I just try to put out what I think is good work or things I want to talk about and the people that find it and resonate with it, they're going to, that's going to stick with them. So I just try to focus on that. Otherwise it's like, I don't have time to deal with the haters. I I just don't know what I would even do. It's like, you want me to yell at you over the internet? Like that's not helpful at all. And I I do want to contribute to, yeah, I mean, there's so much like fake news and stuff out there. And I just try to put like my perspective out in the universe and hope people find it you know, find my comedy. It's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, I love comedy origin stories because there are some people who were like, I've always known I wanted to be a comic since I was 15. And then there's people who were like, I went through this weird ass path and then I landed here. Where do you fit on the continuum of always known versus, oh my fucking God, here I am. Um, I'm definitely more on the, oh my God, here the fuck I am. Um, <laughs> I thought I was going to be either a basketball player when I was a kid. I wanted to play in the NBA, which is not 
possible. And also not to, not to ask, um, um, what, how, what is your, how tall are you? <laughs> yeah. I'm five, five. Like point, point guard. You were yeah. just like really dro- dropping that point, point guard, guard. I was, I was Yes, like, of course yeah, you were. You're five, five. five. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I really That's wanted some big to optimistic energy right there. Yeah. Okay. But like when I was eight, when you were eight, were you five, five when you were eight? <laughs> no, but that's what I'm saying. When I was like eight, I didn't know how tall I was going to be. And I was like, I'm just going to play ball. And then when right. I hit five, five, I'm like, okay, it is going to be a little bit tough to play professionally. Um, or I was going to be like an artist or like, um, like my grandpa's like a scientist. So I like wanted to do that. But I, I kind of stumbled into into comedy um, because like this girl told me I was funny, and then I started like <laughs> taking classes, like improv and stand up classes, and I just liked it, and I kept going. I never wanted to have a regular job, and nobody told me I had to stop. So here I am, like a decade later, still doing stand up, and landing a show. Yeah. Did you pursue a civilian path for a hot minute, or did you like say, "Oh, I'm gonna." I'm in college. I'm doing this. And I think stand up and fuck all that other thing that I was supposed to do. Um, I think when I was in college, I was still trying to figure out like maybe there was like another career path or I I had a hard time with my major. So if I had found one and I was like, I love this, I'm going to do this. I probably would have maybe stopped doing comedy or done that. But I took so many different classes in college and just nothing spoke to me. And the only thing I was like continuously doing was comedy. So after I graduated, I kind of got like a day job at a bookstore and while I was doing comedy and waited till I could quit the day job. <laughs> wow. I love, I love, I love those stories when all of a sudden it occurs to you that you're a comedian. Cause that's yeah. what happened to me. All of a sudden it was like, wow, I do this. This is what I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bizarre. I know. I wish I had that like aha moment that a lot of people have where they're like, I did my first open mic and then I knew I was going to be a comedian forever. That like never happened with me. Um, I just kept doing it. I was like, okay, I think I'm good at this and I like it. So I, this is what I do now. Yeah. And I think that it, when I talk to women as comics so often, it's like, well, I, I did it once and I did okay. Then I did it a second time and then I bombed. So I want to try it a third time to see if I was good. And then I get on for a fourth time. And then like you've done it for six years. You're like, well, I'm still trying it to see if I'm going to do this. A hundred percent. But I read like, what was the point where you were like, I mean, I know you had like a day job, but like, what was the point when you were at the bookstore and you were like, I actually don't have to do this shit anymore. Like, was there, was there a moment in your journey where you were like, I am now making enough money. I can cover all my crap. Yeah, it was when I um, got my college agent and then I booked a bunch of colleges through NACA and that paid way better than me working at the bookstore. I think I did like 25 in a year or something. I was like, oh, colleges? yeah. And I was like, oh, I, I think I'm good now. I'm just going to follow that. And I don't really do as many colleges anymore. But like that it, in my mind, I was like, oh, that's real money. This is like an actual career I can pursue now. Yeah, that dog and pony show can raise you serious cash. Totally. Irene, we are so glad that we could have you joining us today. It was wonderful talking to you, and we are definitely going to have you come back. We hope the rest of your tour goes great, and we can't wait to to talk with you again. Thank you so much for having me. Can't wait to come back, and, uh, you know, you guys all have big day energy, too. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. I've not heard enough of that in my life. (laughs) It's true, though. Thanks, Irene. Thank you. (laughs) Big Day Energy Tour dates are at Irene2.com. You can listen to Irene's comedy album, We're Done Now, streaming on Apple Music, Spotify, Bandcamp, and more. Follow her on social at Irene underscore two. That's our show. Thanks to our guests, and thanks so much to you for listening. You can find out about Christine's work at Seekus and how to support the Real Education and Access for Healthy Youth Act, and find Irene's tour dates in our show notes. You can also support our pod by taking a minute to subscribe, write a review, give us five stars. With your help, we can get more people to learn about this assault on abortion access. Again, follow us on all the socials at Abortion Front to keep up with all the latest repro news. We have some solid abortion access events coming up. AAF will be live tweeting the Miffy oral arguments. So follow that on Twitter at Abortion Front on May 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Also, get tickets to our live show at dramnyc.com. That link is in our show notes. 
and look into where you might fit in to do some abortion activism, you can always check out our five-part activist training series, Operation Save Abortion, at operationsaveabortion.com. The series is available in pod and video form. Make sure to check out the activist calendar, which is chock full of local and national actions and educational opportunities. And one of the cool featured events coming up on the calendar, after you've watched the Miffy case, have some fun. May 17th at 8 p.m., you can join a PowerPoint karaoke fundraiser for Fun Texas Joyce on Zoom. Sounds weird, but hear us out. Participants prepare a PowerPoint presentation on any topic. The weirder, the better. A maximum of eight slides, not including the title slide. But then you have to give a presentation using someone else's slides that you have never seen before. So hilarity will definitely ensue. Sign up to do this amazing event at the link in our show notes. Again, it supports Texas abortion funds. <laughs> Joining us next week, Dr. Sophia Yin, the CEO and co-founder of Pandia Health, will be with us to talk about birth control and the hashtag period optional movement. And comedian and host of the Bituation Room podcast, Francesca Fiorentini drops the righteousness with us. Join our Patreon. You'll support great content and get cool FBK merch and experiences. All pledges support this pod and all of our activism at Abortion Access Front. Pledge at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills. FBK is edited by Remy DeTournay and is produced by Abortion Access Front. Finally, we leave you with the Pringles guy's Nazi cousin, Ethan Schmidt who shows his whole ass by thinking he deserves a piece of someone else's. If I don't have a hundred TPUSA girls lined up begging me to impregnate them in the next year, you know, our country has no hope, no, no future. Um, you know, shoot. I'm the most eligible bachelor in America. If my genes don't get passed on, you know, this country's gonna go downhill real quick. You got all these dummies, you know, having babies, you know. We have you know, we need to start pumping out these Christian nationalists, these white Christian ultra nationalist babies if we want a future. Feminist Buzzkills, the podcast from Abortion Access Front. New episodes drop Friday. When BS is poppin', we pop off. And if you want to support our podcast and all the work of Abortion Access Front, like, subscribe, and join our Patreon at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills.